they even went to China for their honeymoon. Mm. So my dad's been to Israel and all through the Middle East. And Every year, fewer Catholic men and women become priests and nuns. To fill the gap, ordinary members of the church are doing many of the tasks previously done by the clergy. The numbers of priests and religious has declined dramatically in the last uh, 25 years. While many welcome the extra input from the congregation, the church is spending much more on salaries. Catholic financial managers and advisors from across the state are meeting in Newcastle this weekend to discuss, among other things, the implications for the church. I suppose it's the salary element that is probably the biggest demand that are made on the uh, finances of the church. And part of the role of the development funds is then to generate that finance. Jane Anderson, NBN News. at the 200 metres mark, loudspeaker went to the lead, here's All Our Mob and Simon Stad rushing up on the outside, Kabora getting up on the fence, All Our Mob just in front of loudspeaker, Sublimate and Simon Stad, All Our Mob's just in front as they hit the line, it'll win the strat break, All Our Mob, All Our Mob. 4, 14 and 3, the trifecta paying 878.30, the Quinella $38. The BOC Challenge is considered the greatest endurance sailing race in the world. Today, family, friends and wife Cindy were at Newcastle Harbour to farewell Alan Neighbour, Australia's entrant in the solo race. As for any last minute nerves... I haven't had much time to think about it. If I stopped for five minutes I probably would be. Alan will cover about 27,000 nautical miles during the race, spending about 200 days alone at sea. I'm going to have to push myself, and um, but that's good, isn't it? You grow when you with a bit of pressure. Neighbour will have time to fine tune his yacht, Newcastle, Australia, en route to America, where the race starts in September. Today, he set sail for New Zealand with the boat's builder and BOC veteran, Kanga Bertels. It's as ready as it's going to be while it stays here. The, the best way to get a boat ready is to go to sea. Despite the months apart, wife Cindy has given him her blessing. The kids will miss him a lot, but there's no way in the world we'd keep him here because this is what he's always wanted to do. A powerful one and a half metre swell charged into South Shelley Beach to create perfect waves. You minor surfer Dave Nielsen in the white relished the conditions to win his swan song event as a junior. The 20 year old goofy footer pulled off a vast array of powerful moves in the $8,000 event. Also surfing with his back to the wave was second place getter Shane Werner from the South Coast. Gold Coaster Jay Phillips came third despite being the standout surfer over the three days of the contest, while Nelson Bay's Mitch Dawkins was unable to hit his straps in the 25 minute final. Earlier today, Sydney sider Nathan Webster claimed the 1994 Australian junior title by making it to the semis. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News.
ACT in the blue and black and New Zealand side Christchurch have dominated the championships, both entering today's final undefeated. ACT may be the defending champions, but Christchurch came out determined to change that. The boot of Kiwi captain Christine Ross playing in jersey number 10 helped the visitors to continually infiltrate the Australians' territory. And when a scoring opportunity surfaced through a penalty, halfback Anna Richards didn't waste it. New Zealand looked set to make the first try, but a good tackle by ACT captain Louise Ferris changed that. However, soon after, the Kiwis conquered to go 8-0 up. New Zealand maintained the momentum to score several more tries and take the trophy. A national team to play a test against New Zealand in Sydney in September will be named later tonight. The East Coast Band Championship started off as a hunter competition supporting local talent. It now includes bands from throughout the state. Willoughby City was one of ten bands competing today. They're rated as one of Australia's best behind Newcastle's Waratah Mayfield. Unfortunately, they didn't compete with several principal players overseas. During the competition, the bands performed twice. The first piece is judged on technical merit, the adjudicators listening to the performance from behind a screen. It's only in the final piece that the bands score on how well they play to the public. This weekend's competition is, in a way, a warm-up performance to the national titles which will be held in the city. We've actually got the National Band Championships in Newcastle in 1997 and uh, due to that a lot of bands are, are coming to Newcastle to compete in our event uh, to try the hall. As with previous long weekends, police were out in force on our roads. While they're pleased with the reduction in crashes and injuries, there's still some people who insist on breaking the law. Unfortunately, uh, motorists are still continuing to speed and also to drive whilst affected by alcohol. The figures are similar to those that were experienced last year, although statewide uh, the figures, particularly in relation to speeding, are well up. In the Hunter and Central Coast, more than 1,300 people have so far been caught for speeding, 817 of those on the coast. Of the 6,500 motorists breath tested, 42 have been charged, 20 in the Upper Hunter. Despite the warnings, police say motorists continue to combine speeding with alcohol. At 4.30 this morning, a 23-year-old foster man was caught travelling at 101 kilometres an hour in a 60 zone. He also went mid-range PCA. A short time later, the same vehicle was stopped by police and a separate person charged with drink driving. And it's not the only example police cite. Traffic has been building throughout the afternoon as motorists head home. Police expect the usual bottlenecks at Karua, Raymond Terrace and at the approaches to the freeway. Breath testing and radar traps will continue to be used right up until the long weekend operation ends at midnight tonight. When the Newcastle Knights ran onto the paddock yesterday, they knew they had a few supporters behind them. Newcastle has, has always got behind their football team when uh, they're uh, in situations that you classify as big challenges and uh, yesterday was just amazing, wasn't it? 30,251 people went through the gates and hundreds were left outside. 
This, of course, is uh, the second biggest city in New South Wales, and they love their rugby league. Of course, Ray, they... Matthew Johns, the grubber kick. They're going to score. Oh, yes, they are. The Johns boys. And... Andrew Johns with a simple shot to convert. He does that. That's Mackay. So they've gone as far as they can go there. Back now for Tallis to take it up for the third time. <laughs> really interested in the fast break anymore. They're going to use up the shot clock. They like to take their time. And Marty McLean takes the long one. And there's Grant Kruger oh. who gets the offensive rebound. And, it and again this week, he's done the same thing. And maybe that's the. This is for the tech foul. And there it is. He makes it. That's very costly. Just doesn't slip away because another mistake, another three. And. Over the last few weeks, 138 teams have battled it out for the Maitland City Bowling Club's King and Queen of the Hunter Series. Through the knockout format, it came down to just two teams, John and Connie Philp from North Haven and Noreen Stedden and Dick Kelty from Raymond Terrace. Right from the start, John and Connie went for the points, grabbing an early lead. Up for grabs not just the title, but a trip to the Gold Coast and $2,000 in spending money. It was a clash of class players. Noreen Snedden is the Newcastle District champ. Connie Philp has played for Australia. But after three hours, the Philp team came up trumps 23 to 13. The sleepy village of Wollombi, nestled in hills 30 kilometres southwest of Cessnock, has been awoken by the plan to build another guest house in the community. The colonial style cottage would house five rooms overlooking Maitland Road at the Cessnock entrance to the village. Nobody disputes the need for extra accommodation to cater for an increase in tourists, but the town's 500 residents are divided over the size and location of the guest house. Well, I think any more accommodation in Wollombi is a benefit to us. We need to identify more clearly the characteristics that make Wollombi Wollombi. Then we start designing buildings and developments. The original plan was presented to council last year but was amended to meet the concerns of nearby residents. But Evelyn Bloom, who has half of the Wollombi accommodation market with a three bedroom bed and breakfast just one kilometre from the proposed development site, says it will still be an eyesore. I feel that it's very much uh, out of scale with the village and it will be very obtrusive within the village catchment, visual catchment of the village area. There are also fears the development would increase runoff into Mill Pond. But the owner of the other half of the village's accommodation market, Ben Portsias, says the guest house would be perfect for Wollombi. I think it will blend in well. The people who are doing it are very stylish. Uh, it'll take a couple of years for landscaping to be completed, but when it's done, it'll look terrific. Cessnock Council will vote on the proposal tomorrow night. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Despite the dangers, the threat of disease and the breakdown in communications in civil war ravaged Rwanda, Rod Ormond, a civilian doctor attached to the RAAF at Williamtown, believes he can offer some relief to the suffering. After a stint in the Solomon Islands, Dr Ormond is well versed in the treatment of tropical diseases such as malaria, just one of the hazards he's expecting to encounter. I'm very prepared for virtually total chaos there. If there's anything more than, than that, some sort of structure still left in the society that's there, then that'll be a bonus and it'll be easier to work with. Compassion International has operated in Rwanda for 15 years, concentrating on child sponsorship programs. Until recently, the organisation had 11,000 children on its books. 
Due to the conflict, it can now only account for the whereabouts of 60. I think the most important thing, other than perhaps helping a few people who are sick while I'm there, is to bring out information about what's happening with the people there to enable better planning. It was a nervous start, but after some kind words from Miss Kim and a chocolate, Jamie was ready for a big show. The four-year-old from Toronto near Newcastle is the youngest person on the heart-lung transplant waiting list. Jamie is chronically ill. At his tender age, he's already suffered a stroke and had hundreds of heart attacks. What's the situation with the heart-lung transplant? Well, at the moment, we're still waiting. I'm uh, still hoping he could stay stable long enough to still receive a transplant should it become available. With his proud parents looking on, Jamie sparkled for the cameras. Big Dog rates as one of his idols, along with the chief, Paul Harrigan. Jamie has spent 18 months of his short life in hospital, so when he gets out, he tries to kick up his heels. Putting his troubles behind him just for a few minutes seems like good medicine. But from his dad, a plea that everyone should think about the issue of donating for transplants, even though it's an agonising subject. I want families to sit down and discuss and consider organ donations. It's not a hard and fast rule, just to discuss the issue. Make themselves aware. If they're not aware, you know, find out as much information as they can. And so they're just aware. Peter Ryan, NBN News. As part of their curriculum, kindergarten students at Fennel Bay Public School study the circus. Today, they became the part. Now, we present to you our wonderful prancy ponies. How to come ponies? The display was the culmination of four weeks of preparation by the children and their parents. Five circus performances will be held this week before audiences wait another year for the little Big Top to roll into town. Meantime, five students from Glendale High School have returned from the World Odyssey of the Mine Championships in the USA. As part of the contest, they built a mini terrain vehicle which had to negotiate obstacles. They came 42nd in the competition from 53 entries. Are you going to go back again next year for the Odyssey of the Mine? Well, it depends on the costs and depends on how we go, how we go in next year's Australian finals, if we make it, or we'll give it a go. Redhead Tip is almost full. It was to close next month, but last night Council extended its life by some eight weeks to coincide with the start of a new collection service. The decision was made by councillors who feared that if the tip was to close before the new service came online, it would encourage people to dump their rubbish illegally in bushland. The collection system will operate until Council determines where its new transfer station will be located. Environmental problems have arisen over a site chosen at Gateshead. What's going to happen is there'll be four free pickups. Uh, people can just ring in a number, we'll be given to them shortly, uh, and uh, then we'll come and pick up during the following week uh, from the front of their house uh, the rubbish that uh, they leave out. But residents of Redhead say Council has been delaying the closure of the tip for too long. They believe the issue should have been worked out long before now. The rubbish, the smell, the, it's, a, it's a toxic sort of smell when you're driving home of an afternoon or walking up in the bushland, it's very bad. We've had enough. Jody McKay, NBN News.
According to the Chamber's outgoing president, a number of local employers claim they're suffering under the government's fringe benefits tax. We're now going to try and get far more specific and continue to pass those complaints on to government. The Chamber wants to hear from other disgruntled business people and plans to lobby politicians to change the current legislation. Also on the hit list, the recently introduced unfair dismissal ruling. Employees who believe they've been dismissed unjustly can now take their grievances to court free of charge. I do believe one of the problems with getting business to reinvest generally uh, economically is that uh, these businesses have been impacted so much by uh, elements of this sort of legislation. In other chamber news, the Hunter Expo recently displayed in Sydney's State Parliament's foyer is heading on a regional tour before arriving at Canberra's Parliament House later this year. It makes them aware that we're proactive, the things that, you know, we're trying to get rid of the old images about Newcastle and the Hunter. Uh, and we do believe we're successful in, in achieving that. Melinda Smith, NBN News. Set up nearly 14 years ago, KidSafe Australia is an initiative of the Child and Accident Prevention Foundation. National KidSafe Day is designed to raise awareness, this year focusing on reducing the temperature of household hot water. There are various ways in which that can be done. You can either turn the thermostat down the hot water service so that that affects delivery of hot water right throughout the house, or well, there are now devices that you can introduce just at the bathroom level that will control, reduce the temperature of water. Every year, hundreds of children are scalded. A recent spate of incidents in the Hunter continued last night when a five-year-old Newcastle boy was flown to Sydney's Camperdown Children's Hospital after receiving 20% burns to his body from boiling water. Never nurse a young, a young baby or a young child while you're having a cup of coffee because it takes only a few seconds to burn the sensitive skin of a young child. KidSafe says every day in Australia, 5,000 children will need medical attention. 200 are admitted to hospital, at least one or two are killed. KidSafe theme is that child safety is no accident, that we have to think about safety all the time. Melinda Smith, NBN News. Police raided a Nelson Bay house last month after a Crime Stoppers campaign seizing hydroponically grown marijuana plants worth $200,000. When the matter went to court, one officer thought the equipment, which normally would have been dumped, could serve a legal purpose. Seeing that the equipment was valuable and, um, and applying to the magistrate that if, if it was granted to the school, it could be put to good use for the school children of the Nelson's Bay area to further their knowledge on hydroponics. Today, teachers and students from Nelson Bay High School's Agricultural Department took possession of the equipment and the timing couldn't have been better. The week before, the local police had contacted us, contacted us concerning the, uh, the actual equipment they had available. I'd been ringing around uh, pricing some gear for hydroponics. Mr Henderson expects the hydroponics garden to be set up in its new home within several months. We'll be looking at probably strawberries and lettuces uh, will be the, the main crops that will come out of this uh, hydroponics gear. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. Tari and the White kept the attack up to Musselbrook in a fast entertaining match. Tari's centre forward Ian Gates was in blistering form. He jagged four goals, constantly pestering Musselbrook's keeper, Leon Smith. 
Gates, a state rep, may have been the difference between the teams. The final score, 5-1, not a real indication of the battle. Musselbrook never said die, but simply couldn't catch up. About 30 teams started in the Hunter Division of the knockout comp. Both Taree and Musselbrook now move on to the final 30 teams in the state, with Taree seeded as Hunter 1. And San Clemente in the yellow is down Glendale two goals to one in the Lower Hunter Regional Final of the Bill Turner Soccer Cup at Edgeworth. The teams were locked at one apiece at the break. San Clemente is through to the final 16 in the state and will play the winner of tomorrow's game between Armidale's Duval and Cessnock's Mount View. Sections of the Mater Hospital at Waratah are run down. It's been estimated it would cost more than $100 million to refurbish it. Yesterday, the Sisters of Mercy said they want to discuss the future of the hospital with the Hunter Area Health Service. Sister Monica Sinclair suggested the hospital at Waratah specialise in cancer services. Area boss Dr Tim Smythe says it's an option worth considering. That's an interesting proposal. There's a lot of clinical issues would have to be thought through on that and also looking at uh, logistic issues and making sure that there was coordination with other services. If that proposal were adopted, the Sisters of Mercy have suggested the 90 general beds at the hospital would have to be moved elsewhere. They'd like to see a new hospital built which they would run. Well, I think it is an exciting option that is, is worth exploring. Talk of a new hospital for the region comes just two years and ten months after the decision was made to close Walls End Hospital. So, Dr Smythe, yes or no, should Walls End Hospital have been closed? I think the, the issue of Walls End closure is an issue that's well in the past and well behind us. It uh, closed so that John Hunter could open. Dr Smythe says he'll put together a planning study to canvas the options. Jane Anderson, NBN News. The study was carried out in all Hunter High Schools and about 30 primary schools. Questionnaires were given to both teachers and students, principals and welfare officers were interviewed and the results were surprising. I guess the reassuring aspect of, um, that's, that's coming out of our study is that the teachers perceive that the level of actual violence in schools is decreasing rather than increasing and uh, which probably goes against the grain a bit in terms of community perceptions. Rick Frost says it's the first time research focusing on anti-violent behaviour in schools has been done in The Hunter. While the results show the actual number of violent incidents was less than expected, bullies still caused problems. Kids continue to call each other names and pick on each other in school, but the fact that there are some children at school for whom, you know, life is difficult because other kids give them a hard time is, is a worry and uh, we, we continue to explore ways to address that need. The Education Department says more schools are introducing measures such as special anti-violent and conflict resolution programs as part of a statewide initiative to reduce aggressive and disruptive behaviour. Melinda Smith, NBN News.
Dennis Gardner is not one to take it easy. Early Tuesday morning, he was rushed to hospital after being shot in the chest by a .22 calibre rifle. Today he was back at work, a little slower at some chores, but confident time will heal his injury and feeling will be restored to his fingers. I'm a Taurus and uh, they reckon they're impatient. Well, I think I am because I want everything to happen now, you know what I mean? Like, I said, why can't I use my fingers? You know, why hasn't it come good? It's only been, what, 36 hours or something. Mr Gardner lives at the back of his Lake Macquarie video shop. He was awoken on Tuesday morning by a noise outside. He came out to find two men trying to get into this shed. He confronted them with a baton. One fled. The other shot him at point-blank range. I was slumped against a, an old cigarette machine that was out there, a, a cabinet. And when I looked down, and you could see a little hole sort of in the blood just sort of pumping out of it, you know. I realised then that, you know, I, I'd been shot sort of thing, you know. This bullet hole is a constant reminder to Mr Gardiner of how close he came to losing his life. He's been broken into twice before and he believes an attempt was made on the business next door the previous evening. While he says he's a little jumpy, he's determined not to be beaten. So I'm not going to be scared off just because of this. You know, like I said, if, you know, if I hear a noise again, I'll get up and have another bloody look. It's just the way I am. I mean, Police are still searching for the two men responsible. Both are believed aged in their late teens, early 20s. Jody McKay, NBN News.